Hello and welcome to Things We Said Today, our weekly podcast about anything and everything to do with the Beatles, both as a group and as solo artists, past, present, and future when we have the information. I'm Alan Cozen, the author of The Beatles From the Cavern to the Rooftop and Got That Something, How the Beatles, I Want to Hold Your Hand, Changed Everything, and write about music and musicians for The Wall Street Journal, New York Times, and various other places, and I should say Beatle fan. I'm joined by my regular esteemed co-hosts, Ken Michaels, who you know as the host of the syndicated Beatles radio show, Every Little Thing. Hello, Ken. Hey, Alan. Hi to all of our listeners. And I should say also one of the co-hosts of Talk More Talk, a video podcast about the Beatles as in, in their solo careers. And Darren DeVivo, a DJ at WFUVFM at 907 in the New York City area since 1984. If you're not in New York, you can hear him at WFUV.org. And um, his interview archive and, uh, and past shows and all kinds of things are on the site. And because he's not at the moment, having been sidelined by a leg injury. How is it going, Darren? Everything's going slowly, but it's going. You push it, it goes. Hello, everyone. Great to be with you another week here on uh, Things We Said Today. And this week, we're going to be joined by Terry Crane, the author of a new book about uh, the Beatles' uh, memorabilia and all those nifty little things we all collected in the 60s. Um, The book is called NEMS and the Business of Selling Beatles Merchandise in the U.S. 1964 to 1966. I think he was going for a longer title than got that something how the Beatles I want to hold your hand changed everything (laughs) so welcome to the show Terry how's it going (laughs) it's going well hello everyone and uh, hello everybody on the things we said today podcast okay so we will get to the book presently but um, because presently actually means soon not at the present First, we're going to talk about some Beatles-related news, and also we're going to talk a bit about the new film Yesterday, which Ken and I have seen. Darren was still strapped to his bed, so he wasn't able. (laughs) (laughs) So, Ken, over to you for the news. Okay. Well, surprisingly, considering the fact this is our first show in three weeks, there's not too much news that I've accumulated, but here it goes. First of all, Paul McCartney's show on June 28th at the T-Mobile Arena in Las Vegas included a special guest he brought on stage, and that being Steven Tyler, who joined Paul to sing Helter Skelter, which you can uh, you can view online on YouTube. Sounded good together. I don't know if any of you got to see that. Mm-hmm. Yes, I did. I did. Any comments? Okay. It was Paul with Steven Tyler. Yeah. It was, it was, it was, yeah, no, it was great. It was, you know, it was what you'd expect uh, of the of having, well, Paul and Steven Tyler sing Helter Skelter. Yeah. If you envision it in your head, this is what it would what it would have sounded like. That's how it sounded. Pretty exactly. much. Uh, <laughs> Steven Tyler has now worked with all of the living Beatles. This is true. Yeah. And uh, his father was my little brother's piano teacher. How funny is it? This is true. In fact, at the, t- at the time, um, Aerosmith was just getting started. <laughs> and uh, he used to come and tell us about his, you know, his, his son had a band, you know, and uh, sort of following the very beginnings of them. It was, it was really kind of funny because his father, whose name was Victor Tallarico, it is, I believe he's still alive, You know, would tell us what Aerosmith was up to in the very beginning stages of their career. My mother said to him at one point, so, um, you know, is he any good? And his father said, well, he's no Victor Tallarico. (laughs) (laughs) He uh, he taught at a uh, Catholic high school in the Bronx. And I remember hearing a lot of my classmates who went to this school you know, hey, uh, Steven Tyler's father teaches uh, at at, at Spelman High School, you know, because there's Bronx ties there, I believe. So, uh, yeah. 
Stephen Tyler Rico's dad's a teacher. Mm-hmm. Okay. Wow. So, you learn more Aerosmith trivia on this show than you'd ever want to know. There probably. you go. <laughs> so, what else uh, you got, Ken? <laughs> Paul has just made available online a new remix for his song, Nothing for Free, which is produced by Chris Holmes. I have heard it. I don't detect that big a difference between this and the version that came out. First, there was a bonus track on the Target edition for Egypt Station, and it's been on the uh, Travers edition and the Explorers edition of Egypt Station. This is a new version that came out, and the only difference that I really hear is that it's sped up a little bit. Hmm. I don't know, but I've always loved the song, and it has such a great contemporary feel to it. As I said, when Egypt Station first came out, I think if contemporary hit radio played this song as a new single it would be a hit today but they're not going to play music from a guy that old it's just the way it is so how is this being made available i think it's available for um for digital download Uh uh-huh but not for free (laughs) (laughs) there's nothing for free alan yeah yeah just yeah just trying to catch him out here (laughs) How would you learn your lesson here from home? <laughs> okay. Since we're going to be talking about the film yesterday, I can say that it did very well at the box office, mm-hmm. coming in as the number three movie over the weekend, bringing in $17 million behind Toy Story 4 and Annabelle Comes Home. And we will be talking about yesterday in just a few moments. Ringo Starr continues his annual Peace and Love birthday celebration this year, which he's been doing every year since 2008, returning to to the uh, Capitol Records Tower in Los Angeles on his birthday, July 7th. Ringo and a star-studded cast of classic rock stars and other celebrities will be joining the uh, gathered fans. Of those expected to attend will be Edgar Winter, Ben Montench, Sheila E., Nils Lochran, T-Bone Burnett, Jim Keltner, Greg Bissonette, David Lynch, Ed Begley Jr., and uh, Richard Lewis, who seems to be there every year at this thing. And, uh, of course, wife Barbara Bach. There'll be a photo op at 1045 in the morning and performances of Ringo songs at 11. At 12 noon, Ringo will join the world in saying the words peace and love at the same time. And Ringo's feeling... As we all know, is that if you say or think the words, peace and love in the world can become a reality. All right? Mm-hmm. Yoko Ono was among the celebrities showing their support of New York City Pride Week as a photo of her with her arms outstretched on the streets of New York has been shown online with Yoko's message, Happy World Pride, New York City. This is our world, and it's beautiful. I want to survive together. I see rainbows. I see tomorrow. I see a sending rainbow love. Love, Yoko. Nice sentiment there from Yoko. Um, Also, there's a brand new four-part magazine on the history of the Beatles called The Beatle Years being released with the first volume just out. And the front cover reads, From Skiffle Boom to the Birth of Beatlemania, How Four Musicians Forged a Sound That Was As Innovative As It Was Inspirational. The series celebrates the life, legacy, and music of the Fab Four. This first issue has 134 pages. The second volume is due out in December. For everybody that collects this kind of thing. Um, Jeff Lynne kicked off his North American tour on June 20th with a concert of 20 songs with ELO and eight songs in. He welcomed the opening act, Danny Harrison. He sang the traveling Wilbury's favorite, Handle With Care, with Jeff. And Danny sang George's part in the song. You actually get chills watching it, at least I do. You can find the performance of it on YouTube. Danny not only opened the the, uh, show, but just made available online a performance of his music called In Para Live. It's a good hour's worth of performing with his band in the round. If you're not going to this tour, you can check out Danny and his band with this special, also on YouTube. And uh, finally, this all has to do with live performances. And Darren, I think you might have witnessed this. The band Yes has been touring with Asia, John Lodge, and Carl Palmer. As part of their encores, they've been doing John Lennon's Imagine. Hmm. And as most fans know, Alan White, the drummer of Yes, played on the Imagine song and album. 
The current lead singer of Yes, John Davison, did the lead vocal for Imagine. But very interesting, while performing the song, they played clips from the Imagine film, including with Alan White playing the drums while Alan was performing the song live with Yes, which is a very cool thing to do, I think. That's so nice. you saw yeah. this? Yeah, th I did. Uh, I brought my broken leg out and <laughs> uh, saw the tour in White Plains, New York, and uh, which was a phenomenal show. And yes, did you? the first song of their encore was Imagine, and the video footage that they used seemed to be sort of the camera angles and close-ups that we saw in Above Us Only Sky. Right. Uh, they would actually, you know, kind of zoom in on the individual instrument, uh, uh, um, the individual musicians, and uh, basically focused on that. I think that footage was all from from uh, Above Us Only Sky, and they did a really nice version of it, yes. They, they kind of, you know, made it a little longer, spread it out a little bit more. Uh, it worked very well as a Yes song. And Alan White, who really doesn't play all that much any longer uh, due to his health issues, he did come out late in the show to play on a couple of tunes and was back out in the encore playing on Imagine. Uh, so that was pretty cool. Yeah, I've actually seen a video of this. This one of my listeners emailed it to me. And uh, Steve Howe does a really nice guitar solo for this. And um, it's just a great effect to see the band doing this. And you're seeing John on the screen. You're seeing George Harrison, Klaus Vorman, and Alan White. And you're seeing Alan White as Alan's playing <laughs> live in front of you. So you, you watch both at the same time. And it's that's got to be a really cool effect. Yeah, they did it well. And they really made it a yes song. They did it nice. They put their own their own uh, kind of uh, flavor to the tune and yet kept it uh, faithful as well. And uh, it was uh, very well received by the audience. And uh, then they did one more tune after that, I believe. It was only a couple of weeks ago, so of course I forgot already. But uh, they then did uh, Roundabout, if I'm not mistaken, as the final song of the uh, show. Okay. Well, that's all the news I've got for today's show. Okay, so let's talk just briefly about yesterday. Um, Ken, you saw it in a preview, right? Mm-hmm. So what'd you think? I loved it. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you think of this as a fantasy film and not take it all so seriously, it's really enjoyable. The mm -hmm. whole storyline I find interesting. From the moment I heard about it, I thought, this is very Twilight Zone-ish. <laughs> it's like... Uh, I think they had a, an episode of the Twilight Zone where there was a guy that worked in a bank and he wished he didn't have a job there. And then the next day, nobody knows who he is. Mm. It's that kind of thing where you remove somebody like like it's a wonderful life. In a right. Way. Right. Only the only difference here is that this is a guy who's a, a struggling musician and he's about to give up on his career and he loves the Beatles. And then for some reason, during a, a world blackout um, and he has this accident where he runs into a bus he wakes up the next day and no one, no one has heard of the Beatles. The Beatles have been removed off the face of the map. And uh, even when you Google the name Beatles, you get the insect. And so the thing is that this guy, um, Jack Malik is the character's name, has all the Beatles songs in his head. So if you were in that position, what would you do? <laughs> <laughs> you had all those songs, you knew how they all went. Of course, he had to write down all the words. He went to his own record collection, and the Beatles albums were not there. And um, so he had to learn all the songs if he didn't know them already. And as he's playing them to his friends, they don't know what these songs are. So he's unleashing these songs on the world who all think that he wrote them. And so as he's doing this, he's getting known, and he's becoming a big star through the help of Ed Sheeran. And... Um, it's just a, it's a fascinating way of presenting the music. I like the storyline. I think Ed Sheeran was fantastic playing himself. And um, I think too many people think that there's some hidden message in this film, but it's really just a fantasy. Um, and it's a great way of introducing Beatles music a different way. They don't have to be the Beatles arrangements of the songs. So you get to hear this guy perform it, in most cases, alone on acoustic guitar because he doesn't have a band in the very beginning but it's um it's a really good storyline I, I love the actor who played um jack millack he's very believable 
He's a very sympathetic character. You feel for him, because I'm sure that you might be a musician or know of musicians that have struggled like this, and you're rooting for him. And then there's also a, a love angle as well. So they work that into the story. But um, I, I've been a little disappointed in what some people have been writing online, that they were expecting so much more than this. And it's just a fun movie. That's all it's meant to be. It's a fantasy film. Mm -hmm. So that's that's my take on it. We don't want to give away the ending no. of the movie. Yeah. Um, we should say, you know, just since you, you mentioned that you really like the actor who played Jack Malik, we should say his name is Himesh Patel, and he's mm -hmm. uh, of Indian descent, which um, is sort of interesting. Um, for one thing, it, it has a, you know, a Beatles movie that doesn't have to be a European white guy, although he is European, actually he's English, but uh, I think. And mm -hmm. yeah, he was in EastEnders, and uh, so uh, yeah, you know, I, um, I enjoyed it a lot too, and I agree with you. You know, it's 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 like there's really no point in looking for some sort of uh, you know big message in it. It's just a fun film in the way I want to hold your hand was a fun film, but uh, you know, and there's a lot of actually really kind of funny passing jokes in it. I mean, yeah, he goes to his record collection and he he can't find any Beatles records. He pulls out you know, David Bowie and a bunch of others where, you know, you're thinking actually as the records come out, you know, without the Beatles, I don't know that that Bowie album would have been made. I don't know that that would have been made, whatever. Uh, and yeah, all that's true. But I think the the directors did have, uh, or I say director Peter Boyle, uh, did have some fun with that concept because at one point, he goes to his computer and he Googles Oasis and they're not there either. And that's kind of funny because, you know, when uh -huh. he, the, the, actually <laughs> I had, uh, when he was sort of taking these things out of his record collection, I leaned over to my wife and I said, if he was looking for Oasis records, they definitely wouldn't be there. And then suddenly he's Googling Oasis on the screen. It was a little freaky. Um, <laughs> and, yet, and yet he Googles the Rolling Stones and they're there. They're there. Um, <laughs> Which well, no so sense. all it means is that they never released um, I Want to Be Your Man, but they could have, you know, they they were sort of pursuing a parallel thing without the Beatles anyway, as I think some of our Stones-obsessed fans will tell us, including the author of our theme, right? <laughs> mm. So, uh, yeah, you know, I mean, you, you can't get too hung up on the the details. I saw one review pointing out how he, when he went to Russia and sang back in the USSR, it wasn't the USSR anymore. So, okay, fine. It just was really, I mean, to me, it just seemed like a big love letter to the Beatles catalog. And I can totally get behind the idea of a big love letter to the Beatles catalog because it is the zenith of Western Sith, let's face it. Um, but I have another theory about this movie and where perhaps the idea could have percolated from. Okay, so the title, Yesterday. What do we know about yesterday? Paul dreamed yesterday, right? He woke mm. up. He thought, okay, uh, th this has to be a tune. And he went around and he sang it to everybody he knew. And nobody knew what it was, so he wrote it himself. It's basically the story of this movie, in a way, right? You know, I and, never looked at it that way. Uh, no, yeah. they, no, I've never seen anyone. I haven't. Of all the commentary I've read on this, I, I haven't seen anyone come up with that. But it's like, listen, they could have called it Helter Skelter, and it would have made sense. You know, could have called it Scrambled Eggs. <laughs> That's right. They could have called it Scrambled Eggs. So, you know, it just it just seemed like mm, this is sort of like there's there's a little connection here between what Paul says, like maybe yesterday actually existed at some point and only Paul McCartney could remember it. What do you think? Now, now you're thinking too much. <laughs> I think you uh, I think you had a little too much butter in your pot. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I think there's something in the main water up here. I've always said that. <laughs> But anyway, it just sort of struck me as kind of unusual that there is this, you know, connection between the, the, the plot, everybody forgetting the Beatles, no one knowing the tunes, including yesterday, the very first one that's played, um, and Paul's story about going around playing yesterday to everybody and no one knew it. 
So um, there uh, was a report on the Internet that at least according to Peter Boyle, um, who had sent copies of the, of the film to Paul and Ringo and their reps and also Yoko and Olivia, that Ringo yeah, and know. Barbara sent back a, a, a note saying they loved it. Um, he hadn't heard anything from Paul yet. Mm. Um, but uh, yeah, and also, yeah. I, I guess that's probably enough because we don't want to spoil it for people who haven't seen it. But uh, you know what? I just I enjoyed it. I enjoyed hearing those songs in a different context, uh, played right. by someone else. I think Hamish Patel has a really good voice and uh, it was pretty good for these songs. So there we are. And you know, there was a review that uh, someone had written uh, to the effect of, "What makes you think that if the Beatles' music was never heard at all?" but came out today like this, that the world would be going gaga over it. Well, that's not the point. That's just, this is, this is a movie where it just so happens that was the, react, the reaction to it. So, you know, it's, it's like I'm saying, people are thinking too much. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, there's been much too much over analysis of the film, what I've seen on Facebook. Uh, and everything that the two of you have said basically mirrors the trailers that I've seen and, you know, it so far sounds like exactly what it appears to be in the trailers, a fa fun fantasy mm -hmm. and nothing more. Uh, with maybe, I'm sure uh, you had hinted that there are some in-jokes in there that, you know, and that's about it. And if you sync it up with the dark side of the moon, um, <laughs> anyway. anyway. So I do have a question, and I have not seen the movie yet, but I'm just curious, does he know as a guitarist because i'm one also does he know all the chords to all these songs or how does he he seems to <laughs> okay <laughs> what he has what he has problems with are, are some of the lyrics um especially okay. eleanor okay. rigby he's going around for a long time saying okay what so what is she darning socks what was she doing you know oh father okay. mckenzie <laughs> um yeah so uh yeah, there's, there actually is. I think, you know, I think if people um, just sort of, you know, calm down, relax, and, you know, maybe see it again when it comes out on DVD or ends up on Netflix or something, they'll, they, they may kind of see that all of the sort of overheated analysis was really kind of silly because it's just a fun film. That's all it's meant to be, you know, with a wrapped around a, a rom com, you know, a little love story between him and his initial road manager and who's Lily James who was in uh, Downton Abbey so you know it's it just there's there's a lot of good jokes in it actually there's a lot of good jokes not just about the Beatles there's jokes about the record industry and the way it works and the way they think you know they have a big meeting where they're trying to come up with uh, you know the cover and the title of his album and he had proposed you know Sergeant Pepper and stuff like that and they're saying well What's that? I mean, that's a little complicated, you know. And, mm. and the White Album, mm, not enough diversity. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of all things. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it really is. I, 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 just, I enjoyed it. I, I had a good time. I, I wasn't, you know, I'm happy I didn't have to review it. You know, you sometimes when you have to review things, you get pushed into thinking too hard about it. it it's, it's just It's just the nature of the job. Um, so I was really happy I got to go as a civilian and just take it in and enjoy it. And by the way, if you like Kate McKinnon for her work on SNL, mm -hmm. I mean, when it comes to playing over-the-top characters, she is the best at it. And she plays a ruthless record company executive who only cares about making money off the main character here, and she does it well. Yeah. So um, if you love her on SNL, I'm sure you'll enjoy her in this movie, too. Yeah, yeah. And also, whatever you think of Ed Sheeran, um, you know, you got. I got to say, he. I have to hand it to him for basically, you know. There's this one point where there's a contest, a contest yeah. between uh, Jack Malik and Ed Sheeran as himself to write a song in 10 minutes and come back and the, the people hanging out backstage would judge who's his best. And, you know, he comes out and sings one of his songs and uh, uh, Hamish Patel or Jack Mallet comes out and sings Long and Winding Road. And, you know, and uh, Ed Sheeran says, oh, well, you're Mozart, I'm Salieri. Uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> so, uh, you know, I, he, he was really a good sport about, uh, you know, well, I mean, I don't know, how, how good a sport do you have to be to acknowledge that the Beatles are better songwriters than you? I don't know, you know, but uh, <laughs> mm. anyway. But he's so believable, you know, and, and uh, he just does a great job. You know, I don't know if it's necessarily easy to play yourself. You mm. might overact. Yeah. I mean, some people might do that, but he was just so believable and, and very, um, very humble. <laughs> when he heard the long and windy road, yeah. said, you know, basically, I've given up, you know. <laughs> so, so for the sake of our show, I'm actually slightly sorry that it isn't the film isn't I want to hold your hand because that had actual Beatles memorabilia in it (laughs) and it would have made a fantastic segue into (laughs) the interview part of the show which I have now faked (laughs) (laughs) so Terry (laughs) yes why don't we start by I mean you this is your first book right Correct. You were a dean at a college in. I was. Uh, yeah. Yes. Uh-huh. Um, and what led you to take this on as a project? I've always had this fascination for the items. Uh, when I was young, my sister had the the George Remco doll sitting on her on her desk, and I would see that thing every day and think how cool that was. So as you know, the years go by and all that, it, it, and everything you like the band and all that. And there's so many things you could do. Do you do the records? Do you do that stuff like that? And I kept being drawn to the items because especially the items in 64, 65 and 66, that was the the coolest items on the planet. Some of them were cheesy. Some of them weren't the best quality and all that, but who cares? They were, they were the coolest things you could ever get a hold of. And I just kept being more and more interested in those items and not necessarily you know what do they cost and all that stuff but some of the background behind the items is is just uh, really neat is what it is Mm -hmm. i think the the approach that you took is in a certain way a bit like the approach bruce spicer takes for his uh record books exactly uh it's you know there are there are user guides out there for all of these items and these user guides are wonderful books i've got many of them on my shelf right here and they're the user guides and price guides and all that kind of stuff but one thing that i was looking at is when you look at a price guide well and i'll use the remco doll for example it says well the doll was four inches high it had dark hair and it wore a black suit and and then the entire rest of the time that it talked about the doll, it told you what it was worth. It was worth this much if it held a guitar. It was worth this much if it didn't. If it was damaged, it was this and all that. And I wanted to know more about the item. I wanted to know who made that island item, maybe who designed it, uh, what company did it, uh, are they still around, and that kind of thing. And I really, and I hate to say it this way, but I really didn't care and still really don't care what an item costs you know what's it worth right now i don't know but did you know this about a certain item that's Mm -hmm. kind of the take that i took on it Mm -hmm. do you have a lot of this stuff in your own collection Uh, no i have about uh five or six items sitting here in front of me i do i am well aware that many of them are uh very expensive right now and i have been to some collector's houses that is just unbelievable to see what they have and all that but it, it just became a a fascination to me and one of the things i think that i look at a little bit differently is you know i can be right next to the pair of uh, beetle headphones that that are worth a lot of money and all that and then right next right next to it is the handkerchief which is not as quote cool or whatever to some people but to me they're just as equal they're they're both nims items they're both from the same time and they're just as cool and just as awesome with each other, not caring how much one is worth versus the other one. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, we tend to sort of go around, uh, you know, each ask a bunch of questions. And if we can get around a uh, second time, if we have time, uh, you know, we'll do some more. Uh, so why don't I pass you to Ken? Okay. Terry, one of the things that I love about your book is that you give a little history lesson as to what pop merchandise was like before the Beatles. And that was a valuable lesson for me because I would have thought, and we talked about this because I interviewed you privately uh, before, that an artist like Elvis Presley 
there must have been a lot of stuff that came out on the market on Elvis Presley or someone like a Rick Nelson who had his own TV show with his family. But it really didn't explode until the Beatles appeared on the Ed Sullivan show. Yeah. And um, what exactly did we have prior to all that? And you also said to me that so many manufacturers wanted to put out Beatles merchandise then thinking uh, you know, we better cash in while we can while they're hot. I'd like to know why a manufacturer would think that way if it was something that they viewed as something that would be short lived. I think that in the early the forties, fifties and 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 before that, you know, you had items like the Wizard of Oz and you had the Superman and you had the uh Disney stuff and all that, but there really wasn't a concentrated effort mass merchandising marketing in the United States with any of those items like they were. They had little pots that you did this and did this and somebody would try this to see if it worked. But you did not have that effort, that controlled, we're going to manufacture and produce this item and we're going to market it around this item because right now this is the hottest band on the planet. You did not have that kind of effort until what I say was February 10th of 1964, the next morning after the Beatles hit Ed Sullivan. So you had many items like the Davy Crockett's, the Disney, the Hopalong Cassidy, any of this stuff like this that went on before that, but you didn't have that one effort to put all this in front of the U.S. public until that next morning of the Ed Sullivan Show. And I mentioned that the next morning of the Ed Sullivan Show, to me, is a very important date because that morning, all of the uh, the cell tab or cell tab, however you want to pronounce it, the Beatles U.S. Uh, item company. That next morning, you had all these manufacturers and all these businessmen beating on the hotel room door of the merchandising company and said, if we have money in our hands, we have an idea. We want to make a doll. We want to make a, an apron. We want to make this jewelry and all this. And it be, because they thought at that moment, this is such a big thing going on. And yes, it might only last six months. And yes, it might only last even just a little bit less than that. But we need to cash in as quickly as we can. And everybody seemed to have the same idea at the same time. Because from February 10th for about the next week or two or a few months, you had 150 of the neatest items come out in the United States and all over the shelves of Woolworths and everywhere that the Beatles were front and center in your mind. There was no internet or everything to keep them going. So you had to keep the idea of them going. And what better way to do it than on the shelves uh, of some of your local uh, uh, drug stores and, the, and any kind of store like that. So I'm just curious as to why the same approach wasn't made towards Elvis Presley, being the biggest, the biggest name of the 50s. That's a good question. I guess that one defining moment, like the uh, 7 p.m. Central, 8 p.m. Eastern, Ed Sullivan, that one defining moment that maybe lit the fuse for everything did not happen that you could just point to Elvis and say that was his moment or a Disney that says that was their moment from that point on, here's what we're going to do. So I think that helped ignite the whole thing, was the that moment being the catalyst for everything else that happened. Mm. Okay, one last question before I pass you over to Darren. You do say in the book that um, you look at Brian Epstein as being a pioneer when it comes to merchandising of this nature. When you hear so much about how he was taken advantage of and in the very beginning, he only made 10% of uh, the licensing revenues. Why would you say that about Brian? I think that Brian gets a bad rap right then because just like we talked about, this had never happened before in the US. There was no blueprint on how to take care of this merchandising. There was no YouTube video you can watch. There was no book out that says, here's what you do. No one had the experience of that. So you've got these companies who come up to, uh, to come up to Brian and say, you know what, we're going to offer you this. And Brian, he probably goes, now let me get this straight. All I'm going to do is give you the Beatles names. I'm going to give you a couple photographs and you're going to give me 10% of all the money that we're going to make. And I don't have to do anything. This is the greatest gig on the planet. I mean, and he had no experience. He had, like I said, no blueprint. So to him, this was probably a great thing. And when people 
always now talk about the 90% that they didn't get and the 10% they didn't get. You know, I look at that as, as, as hindsight. You know, hindsight makes everybody brilliant with 2020 vision. And mm-hmm. no one knew what was going to happen then. No one knew that we were going to be talking about this 50 years later on this broadcast right now. So they're going to go, they're going to go, well, okay, let's, uh, we're going to take this 10% because who knows how much this is going to last. So I think everybody talks about that now with their hindsight, which I give him a break on that. I mean, he did the probably for that moment in time for the knowledge he had and everything, he probably thought that was the best thing that he could do. Now I will say a few months later, when they handed him from uh, cell tape, they handed Brian the $9,000 check, the first one he ever got, the royalty payment. And he said, this is great. Then he said, well, how much did you get? How much of this is yours? He said, no, that's all yours. And then he did his math and said, well, that means if I get 9000 they must have got 90000 Well, then maybe it kicks in real quick that he made a mistake. But up to that point, you know, who knew what was going to happen? Mm-hmm. And then he renegotiated right after that. He did. He he used his British math and thought, if I'm only getting 10% and they're getting all this other one, I'm going to renegotiate this. And they got that started and, and got that taken care of. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, I'm going to pass you over to Darren now. All right. Well, that last question actually did touch on what I was going to ask, which was merchandising in uh, 1964 in many ways, it was uncharted territory. Uh, There's no formal blueprint on how an artist or any any um, personality, uh, whether it be an actor or a music group, could be merchandised. Does your book touch on what would, I'm sure, become a black market that would uh, develop of items that were manufactured where nobody went to Nems or Brian or the Beatles or whomever, and we're putting products out there that uh, were just uh, developed separate from the Beatles without the, their involvement? Very little do I touch on that. I thought that the 150 licensed items in the U.S. were the main talking points about the book. Sure, you had other items you had the quote fake stuff or the quote reproductions or people who just didn't bother to try to go get the the license for it i I do touch on those a little bit but the emphasis i think so much was for the 150 because of all the other books and the stuff that i would look at they would talk about well there was about 150 items and the price guide might give you an idea and you could count them up and you'd come up with about 110 and another person's price guide you would count up and they would come up to about 95 so i finally was going you know what i can't find a list one list of these items that were licensed that are out there and i keep hearing this so my book was an attempt to try to get that one final list out there that says here were the items right there that were the licensed thing. But some of the unlicensed stuff has great stories also. And, and even some of the unlicensed, I go in the book about some of them that were, that were being sued by some of the licensed items. Uh, so I did go into that a little bit. But my, the emphasis was on the 150 that were, quote, uh, legal at that point. But it's very fascinating because, like I said, it was such uncharted territory I'm sure there weren't any accurate records being kept because it's like the the items were being dreamed up and manufactured on the spot, and the whole uh, whole idea of a merchandising a musical band was kind of a new thing. There was no; uh, it must have t- t- taken a lot of uh, legwork on on your part to attempt to round up close to exact number of officially licensed items. Could One there the f- still be some more out there that were licensed that maybe were manufactured in such, such small quantities that um, you, you didn't turn them up or anyone else hasn't really made proper documentation of them? So far, uh, and yes, there, there could be. There, there very well could be. But so far... That's one of the things about putting this list out there and, and all this. I just I just wait for someone to come and say, wait a minute, you forgot about. And that's fine because that's that's the perfect research that I want to do to see if I actually have 
missed something or done or did this. And back to the one point about the records, that was one of the interesting, frustrating things about this is, you know, there's no Microsoft Word, there's no Excel spreadsheet, there's nothing like that that people had back there. I, I put a little thing in the book about the guy in it, sitting in his big chair. They decide one day, you know what, the Beatles items aren't making any money. All he does is pull his files out of the big black file cabinet and he throws them in the trash. There's no accountability on some of this stuff that you can follow. And some of these things are so interesting on my part, uh, well, what I think. For example, there might have been a company in 1965 that made item X. Well, that company in 1969 might have been bought out by this company. And then another one in 72 bought that out. And I would find some of these companies, they might have been bought out five or six times by different companies. And just to follow the flow chart to go through some of these companies is amazing. So I would finally find, like, if company X is still alive in, in this year, I would contact company X and say, hey, way back in 65, <laughs> There was this company, and then after six generations, you guys bought them through all that, and they would come back to me and say, yes, we did, and we have no records of that company, but by golly, we knew we bought them. <laughs> and I would run into that all the time from parent companies who, who, who they had you know, no records. One of, one of my favorite is the Beatles skateboard. There was a legit Beatles skateboard. The company was the Surf Skater. They took out an ad in the trade magazine. They had, you can see the skateboard right there. It had the picture of the lads on the front. They had the model number. They took out an ad in the, all the trade magazines and all that, telling you when it's coming out, all about the model numbers and everything like that. And the next thing you know, the skateboard, no one has ever has any records of it ever ending up on a shelf anywhere. So somewhere between we've got it ready, we are advertising it, and actually going down to Woolworths to buy it on the shelf, Something happened in between there, and it never got out. There's no collectors that I have right now that have ever found one, but it was a licensed item. It's just stories like that are so interesting. Hmm. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I have a lot of this stuff, and, uh, and <laughs> this is um, great to sort of page through and say, oh, I, I got that one. I got that, yeah. You know, and some of these things that I thought were knockoffs, like certain of the the dolls that aren't the Remco dolls or the Goldberger dolls, uh, <laughs> <laughs> which really are really bad knockoffs. Uh, you know, I would have thought were knockoffs, but they turn out to be in the books, like the, the car mascot uh, yep. dolls. I always thought those were fakes. I, it never would have occurred to me that those were licensed. So I'm happy to know that another bit of my collection is actually real. Um, and those, those car mascots are, are cool because you see those, you probably got the eight inch ones uh, that are in there. They've got the 15 inch that are in there that are really rare and mm. were never, de never designed to even be sold. They, yeah. they were the advertising part to get you to buy the eight inch ones. Mm. And there's one thing I'm looking for. I have a Beatles ruler that, Looks legit to me. I, I don't know if it says NEMS on it, but I can't find it in the book. And, you know, I, I looked in the index. The, the, there are certain, like, index uh, or, or table of contents entries for things where there were only one or two uh, things, like a, you know, record carrier or a notebook or a pen holder or whatever. And there's, there's no um, ruler separately. So I'm assuming that if it's in here, it's sort of hidden in some... Uh, thing that I will one day find, but uh, you 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 will not find it because it, that was that was not a licensed item back that then. That was not. Ah, it Correct. looks so close. It looks so much better oh. than some. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, and and I've had this discussion before with people. Some of these quote fake or unlicensed items or what like that. Some of those are still forty and fifty years old. I mean, yes. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, that's just, even though their quote didn't have the stamp as license, they're still the, the cool thing, just like your ruler. Your ruler was probably mid-60s or, or late 60s. Well, that thing is still old, you know, that kind of thing. So it's still really cool. It just didn't have the uh, the NIMS or the cell tab license of approval stuck on I it. I see, yeah. yeah it, looks, it looks early. I mean, it, it's got like 1964 portraits and then, you know, signatures and the whole deal. Oh, um, yeah. Yeah. So, um, 
what I do like about this, and you know, it's partly what I was getting at earlier when I said, uh, you know, similar to Bruce's books, is the lavish illustrations and the documents, and uh, it really is a story that hasn't been told, and uh, it's stuff that people of uh, a certain age, as I think you say at one point in here, are still fascinated with, at least as a nostalgic thing, and. In November at the uh, White Album Conference in uh, Monmouth, New Jersey, Monmouth University in New Jersey, one of the last things they had was Mark Lewis in doing a thing where you know you bring up an item and he will talk about it for sixty seconds. And a lot of things people brought up were like a comb, a beetle comb, uh, you know, or, or some other item like this. And uh, a lot, of, most of them, he knew uh, some of the particularly American ones he didn't, but uh, I would think that he'd find this book really handy for boning up for future installments of that. You know, One of the things I like about the book that has hit even harder once I get out and I talk about it and all this that I really didn't think about when I was writing it, but this book has a lot of what I would call memory triggers Mm-hmm. And I will have people come up afterwards and go, oh, I used to have this, or I remember this, or I remember this. And I think that that adds so much to the actual items and everything. And that's why in the book I've put all these little paragraphs and all from people who have had these items, who remember things about it, who mm-hmm. remember situations that, oh, this happened, and I remembered the Rimco doll was sitting there, or whatever it is. Yeah. That's, that's what I think adds to the things like that. Once I start getting stories like that from people that would tell me this or tell me that about a certain item, I knew I had to include those in the manuscript because it just, it just painted a much better picture of the items. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I should run past you the uh, Philip Norman theory. You know what I'm referring to, right? Tell me. Yeah. Uh, you know, in, in when Shout first came out, and I believe it's still in the current edition, although I know that Philip himself has kind of distanced himself from it, he <laughs> includes this sort of theory that Brian Epstein and um, I think David Jacobs and some other people might have actually been murdered over some of the contractual stuff that happened with the NEMS things, you know, contracts for the same stuff given to two competing firms or or whatever. Uh, so I'm sure in, in researching this, you tussled over that question, at least for a minute. Uh, any any well, thoughts on it? I have put that, there is a, a little bit about that in the book. There are so many just on that alone, there's so many websites and conspiracy theories and everything out there about that, that if anybody wants to go even deeper into that, and they go from one extreme to the other. So I haven't actually got into that much of the research of it, but is is any of that possible? Hey, any of that could be, could be a, a special part of what went on at, at this time. Yeah, because there was, you know, I mean, Phillips... I guess motivating motivating uh, underpinning for that theory was that an awful lot of money was involved in this more than anybody would have guessed at the time they were doling out these contracts and uh you know some people made some some people didn't and uh you know it could have been something that got someone very upset if not murderously upset but, uh, exactly. Yeah. And I always I always think it's kind of odd. You've got NIMS, who's the parent company of all this stuff, and you've got Celtab, who's the U.S. arm of NIMS. Well, if NIMS didn't like what Celtab was doing on a certain things, they just couldn't say, well, stop doing that. For some odd reason, in, in the written into the legal terms and all that, if NIMS didn't like what Celtab was doing, they had to sue them. They had to sue them and say, well, we need you to stop doing this and all that, so we're going to sue you. So I, I, it was just odd that you just can't say, well, as the parent company, you guys need to stop that. Well, that, that didn't happen. You had to go through the legal courts just to get your kid to quit doing certain things. Really? Huh. Yeah, it's really a complicated um, issue, this whole merchandising thing. And they were, as you say, sort of making it up as they went along. Yes, I'm curious about the fact that this book 
covers the years 1964 to 66. Uh, what, um, what did you come across that goes beyond 66? And might there be a second volume to uh, uh, the merchandising uh, that was developed in the late 60s? Well, the natural progression with this book, the, the defining line in my eyes is in 67 and all that, 66, 67, the yellow submarine items come out. That's a whole, in the way I look at that, that's the whole next line of everything that comes out. So there is a simple dividing line between all the, the cool early stuff, you draw the line, yellow submarine stuff, items start coming out. So that's what helped me decide which ones to look at. And, you know, who knows, that would be the next uh, wave to go through there would be the yellow submarine items. Mm-hmm. How many how many uh, years uh, was this book in uh in the works two plus the plus is a lot of different plus. two i say two because of that's the one i could really i retired so i could get it get after it every day for many many hours a day but it was but i, I had notes way before all that before the final two years hit mm-hmm. okay and did you notice one of my favorite items is grow hair on the beetles and i always yes. say that one uh-huh. yes <laughs> that's one of the being a fan of the chia pet myself, <laughs> uh, I was hysterical that they were doing it back then. And of course, I always, I, I can't get out of my head Saturday Night Live skit about chia head. For those of us who are follically challenged, you know, to have the chia seeds and you apply them to your own scalp. And, you know, you could have the chia plant uh, growing on your head. But seriously, they had chia pets in the mid-60s. Hmm. Yes. Yeah, you could buy this piece of cardboard, because that's all it was. It was a piece of cardboard, and this piece of cardboard was divided into four sections with John Paul, George, and Ringo on each section, and you tore off the one beetle that you wanted, to, uh, one beetle at a time, and you set it in a glass of water. And after about a week, the hair would grow on that beetle uh, from your glass of water, and it was just awesome. And one of the things, if you look through a lot of these things, the ads for these items, I mean, the, ad, the items are the stars of the show here, but the ads for these items are just as cool. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, cool. watch them grow their own hair live in your own living room. <laughs> have your have your friends come in and will help you give each beetle a haircut just like you want to. I mean, the, the marketing of this was just outstanding. You know, c- come 1967, when they started growing facial hair and growing their <laughs> hair longer, I mean, the possibilities were endless. <laughs> exactly. Um, <laughs> and having longer hair, too. Yeah. I got uh, a couple of odd questions. <laughs> First of all, I just want to know, for any product that was sold in the U.S., did they all have to say NEMS on it to be legit? No, uh, you'll find some that said NIMS. You'll find some that was bl- that were blank. Some of them would just have a copyright symbol on that about NIMS. Some of them, you know, and th- 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 that's one thing that made it hard. There's no consistency in that. You'd think all 150 would have copyright NIMS. Well, then you found out that some of the I- unlicensed product had that also. So that wasn't a defining factor as you might think it would have been uh, to tell you whether it was licensed or not. Mm. Now, I'm wondering, because we talked about this in our interview, I brought up the fact that Baskin and Robbins put out beetle nut ice cream. And (laughs) I'm curious to find out what that even tasted like. But are there items like food that you couldn't include in this book? Because you do have ice cream bars in here that were made by HP Hood, which you can buy, I guess, in a supermarket. Yes, so were there other items that you were aware of that probably wouldn't apply here because it wasn't something that was packaged that you can save? Although I can't imagine people saving these ice cream bars in their freezer for 50-plus uh, years. <laughs> right. I, I can't think of this moment of any other food item. I do know that there, you know, there were wigs that were unlicensed. There's a, there is an awesome, if you ever get a chance, go out on, go out on YouTube and kind of uh, – Google about Beatles wigs and all that. There is a wonderful interview made, I believe, in New York, around the New York area, from a company uh, that was making Beatle wigs. Well, what they don't tell you is these wigs were unlicensed. But just watching them make these wigs and watching them tell you how 
some of the, quote, ladies that had kids at home would take the wigs at home at night and work on them then also. I mean, it's, it's just it's just <laughs> fascinating to watch this. And anytime you see these YouTube videos about for 1964 and all that, that talk about the wigs, the best part of the video is watching the models. They grab the, the guys and the gals who worked on the assembly line to put these wigs on. And the, the, those times are hysterical to watch that. <laughs> I also found it interesting that there are certain musical instruments here uh, that came out. Now, I would expect guitars and I would expect drums, but you have bongos. Yep. There were beetle bongos and beetle banjos. Mm -hmm. So yep. there was some thought put behind other instruments that the Beatles at that time didn't even play. So, exactly. You know, they came out with the harmonica. And there was always a tie somewhere. Well, John played the harmonica, so Honer, the big harmonica company, came out with that. And they even sent you, when you bought it, you got some sheet music to help you play two of the Beatles' uh, harmonica songs. Now, I don't read harmonica sheet music, so I'm not sure how, how good it is, but they included that in there. And they didn't even make a special harmonica for it. What they did was they just grabbed one of their own models they already did but they put it in a box that had beetles on it and all that and it went it it sold like skyrockets it was great mm -hmm. mm. now the the most valuable of all these merchandise items today would be what i think right now it's the record player there is a uh, record player in there it's a it's blue they only made five thousand of them in the u.s and this record player retailed for like $29.95, which is way above any of these other Beatle items that they had. So it wasn't, it just wasn't purchased very much because of the, uh, because of the price tag that they had on it. It came in a box that was like, it was cardboard, but it was so small and all, it was almost shrink wrapped around this this cardboard so very few of the boxes even lasted because everybody just had to tear the box open just to get into it but that right there is is when i've talked to collectors that is the holy grail right now is the the beetle record player and i saw one recently out on ebay and it was ten thousand dollars plus right now wow. and it used to be 29.95 wow is that the record player there's a little picture of it on the back cover of your book Yes, that's it. Yeah. Okay, that was a, They did a, uh, I believe, something similar to that, or a replica, facsimile in recent years. Exactly. Of, of that record player. Yeah. One of the interesting things about that is that the Lion Lionel Company. Yes, the ones that used to make trains and all that. Mm -hmm. They thought they were going to get the license for a record player, so they had already made a prototype of the record player and all that, and had a few of them made, and then they realized they did not get the license. So they didn't know what to do with these record players, so they put them out, a couple of them out, and instead of having the Beatles picture on there with all four Beatles, they had drawings of three people, uh, one guitar, one bass, and one drums, and you couldn't tell who they were, but they sure looked an awful lot like the Beatles. Hmm. And uh, so that lasted less than a month because they were about to get sued for all of that so that that's just one of those one of those side stories that you find with stuff like this mm -hmm. it's really interesting because there are, you know this shows and a lot of other books that have come out recently have shown that there really is a whole world of uh, you know we started out with biographies and then we got to price guides and discographies and then you know bruce's things about the specific labels mm -hmm. and the 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 deals that went on, particularly with the American records. But, you know, actually, every single aspect of the way the Beatles were marketed and the way they did what they did uh, is is kind of worth a book here. I mean, this is, uh, you know, as you say, it's not a price guide, which most books like this were until this. Um, but this is really just beautifully done you know the photos are great the paper is really good quality uh and this is did, did you publish this yourself yes so fab gear company llc is you it's it's me sitting here in my in my room <laughs> yeah and that's and that's like you know <laughs> that's sort of another um sort of interesting trend within beatles publishing uh because you know some of the at this point some of the best most fascinating Beatles books 
coming out are really self-published things. I mean, Bruce's books are all his own company. Mm -hmm. Chip Manninger, mm -hmm. Eight Arms to Hold You, and Leninology, those are him. And I think, you know, what, what people who do, um, John Wynn's books as well. And what a lot of people say is that doing your own book uh, like this really sort of gives you complete control over the paper stock, the color reproductions, all that stuff. And is is that why you did it this way? Did you just want to have you know total say over it? It is. It gives you the ability to put down what you really want to say. And I will say, all those books that you just talked about, the Bruce Spicer and all that, they're all on my shelf right here. So what is what is interesting is I would be able to go through all these books and go, okay, I like this part of this book and I really like how he did here, but on these books over here, I don't like how these look and all that. So you start taking your own notes, not only about the content of the book and all that, but how you want the book to look. Where do you want to put the margins? Where do you want to put the pictures? What works best in this book versus another one? And you start taking pieces of all these different things and put them all together. And that allows you to do that is what happens when you do a self published book like that and you see what works and doesn't work for other ones that it allows you to take the best of all worlds mm -hmm. um, and you can go more in depth with your subject that you, you couldn't do with a mainstream book. one of one of the things that i think was always is oh, the, the interested part is there had to be a day that i said okay the book is done and i pressed the enter button and i sent the the uh, manuscript off to the printer. There had to be a day like that. But I was so worried about that day because I just knew the moment I hit that button, an hour later, I'd find something to say, oh, I should have put that in the book. Or I'd find another image or I'd find something like that. I'd go, oh, and that, that to this day, that I, there is so much, I, I just can't stop researching this stuff, finding out even more stories about all these different items and all that. And there are so much more that I could have included now that is just, it, you just, things just keep popping up. You just keep finding things. Mm -hmm. So you're going to do eventually, you think a second edition that will update? Well, what I did do was I put it into, I waited about uh, three or four months after the book came out. And then I brought out the ebook version. Well, wow. the ebook version has all the updated uh, items that I have done. You know, I'm, I may have put a comma in the wrong place, or I may have said, okay, there were seven colors, and then afterwards I realized, oops, there were eight. Well, I've, I've edited all that in the ebook version. So that's what's neat about this. That the ebook format allows you to put the most updated stuff out there, and who knows, you know, what may happen down the road. I may come back out. We're, I'm keeping track of everything that the uh, that I'm updating, and we may do uh, another another run sometime. This run has a run of a thousand books, and uh, who knows what happens when those are out. Okay, we should tell people how to get it. You, they can go to www.fabgear, F-A-B-G-E-A-R, dot company, and it's right there on the front page. Fab Gear Company. Okay. And it's also available through Fest for Beetle fans catalog, which Fest is where, where I got mine, which is number 247. There you go. And it's also out on Amazon and it's also out on eBay. So I've tried to hit the, I've tried to hit the, the, the big places out there to get it out. So those thousands should go pretty quickly. It's thousands, you know, not a lot. And I'm keeping track. <laughs> Very carefully. <laughs> okay. And are you a, a one-man operation, or are there members of your family who have been put to work in my the process? My, my wife is helping me package every book that goes out, and she has it down to a science, and I have it down to a science. And who would have thought that well, we would we would be doing this? But uh, it it works out pretty cool. <laughs> That's great. Ooh. Okay, so it's, it was really fascinating looking in this book that, uh, you know, covers yet another area of this incredible, huge topic that we uh, are all fascinated with. And uh, I think we'll uh, give you our contact information and start with Darren. Okay, and before I give my contact information, I, I just want to say how I really, really enjoyed this book, Terry. There are dozens upon dozens, dare I say, hundreds of Beatle books out there. But uh, you grabbed the topic and uh, covered it thoroughly, a topic that is not 
really been uh, been touched on, and definitely not as well as you have uh, with this book. Thank you. So I very, very strongly recommend to uh, to get Terry Crane's book, NEMS and the Business of Selling Beatles Merchandise in the U.S., 1964 to 66. And my contact information is, uh, you can email me at Darren DeVivo at WFUV.org. Uh, and that's my name spelled out, D-A-R-R-E-N-D-E-V-I-V-O. Or go to Facebook and uh, like my radio page, which is Darren DeVivo on WFUV Radio. So uh, go for that page as opposed to my personal one, and uh, we'll be in touch. Okay, and Ken? Uh, my email address is everylittlething at att.net. My website is kenmichaelsradio.com. There are loads of interviews on the website with people in the Beatle world and Beatle authors, and I'm sure there are many of you listening right now who cannot get enough of Terry Crane. And for those listeners... You can hear more, more of an interview <laughs> that I did with Terry, in which we tackled some of the same subjects here and other merchandise items. And it's right there on interviews, page four of my website. Don't forget that uh, every single week there's weekly Beatles trivia where you can win one of nine prizes every week, uh, books, CDs, DVDs. We just gave away a copy of Terry's book in a special contest mm-hmm. on my website. Thank you for uh for getting involved with that, Terry. Mm -hmm. And um, also, for those of you that want to hear my syndicated radio show, Every Little Thing, once in a while I mention this website where there are archived episodes, which you can stream at any time. That's at globaltexanchronicles.com. And uh, don't forget, Monday nights, every other Monday night, Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast, which you can watch live as it's going out on Facebook on our Facebook page and then you can watch later on on our Facebook page and on YouTube Uh, the latest show will be all about George Martin and his work with the Beatles and their solo careers okay and that's with Ken Womack, Kid O'Toole and Tom Hunyadi and that's about it okay Terry how do people get in contact with you if they want if they need to or want to okay my email address is fab.gear at terrycrane.com or they can go to the fab gear company out on the internet and and find me that way and i'll say one more thing if you have a a alexa app uh, an alexa at your house or whatever if you ever decide that to learn something about the beatles and you go to your alexa and, and you pick up this week in beatles history or uh daily beatles facts I designed both of those also, so you'll be able to hear me tell you about Beatles items right on your Alexa. All right. Okay, and to get to me, uh, you can reach me on Facebook, either at Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remix. That one has a little bit more bass. Also, uh, I'm on, you know, a periodically turn up on another podcast uh, called Swinging Through the 60s with Richard Buskin and Eric Taros and Craig Bartok. And this week, the new edition of that I'm on, and it's about She Loves You. Just about She Loves You. We talk about She Loves You for an hour and 17 minutes. And. It actually is, if I say so myself, a really good show. So check that out, Swinging Through the 60s. It's episode 29, I believe. Uh, And to reach any of us here at Things We Said Today, you can email us at thingswesaidtodayradioshow at gmail.com. It's kind of a single, long, Germanic-style name. Things We Said Today Radio Show, one word, at gmail.com we also have a twitter account which is at things we said fab and you can reach us on facebook at things we said today beatles radio fans so this has been a a fun show and uh for terry crane and ken michaels and darren devivo i'm alan cozen and thanks for listening and we'll see you next time (laughs) 